you everyone for attending. And to start off, again, welcome to another installment of the Fall Technical Conference 2021 webinar series. As a reminder, um, please silence your microphones. I know this is a webinar, so most of them probably already are, but it's good to double check. And again, if you have a question at any time, uh, you can either, um, during the presentation, I'd encourage you to use the Q&A box. I'll be monitoring that. And then afterwards, you might have time. If you want to raise your hand, um, you can do that as well. Let's see. There we go. Uh, quick blurb about the, the Fall Technical Conference. Um, it's an annual conference co-sponsored by the American Society for Quality, specifically the Chemical and Process Industry Division and the Statistics Division, as well as the American Statistical Association, in that case, the Joint Section on Physical and Engineering Sciences and Quality and Productivity. And the goal of the conference is to engage researchers and practitioners in dialogue leading to more effective use of statistics to improve and quality and foster innovation. If you want to learn more, you can check out the website below. You'll also find detail, more details about uh, this webinar series, um, the specific dates and times on that. So I'd encourage you to check that out. You can also look at some of our past conferences as well. And this year, uh, we've postponed the in-person conference and replaced it uh, with a webinar series. But Next year, we're hoping to be able to come back together. So save the date. Uh, Mid-October, we'll be looking to gather in Park City, Utah. So hopefully we'll see you there. And here's the uh, schedule for the webinar series. Um, we did have a slight change. So um, this last week, we had to reschedule the talk by Tony Pormah Pormah excuse me, Poor Mohammed. Um, so he'll be at the end, but we encourage you to check out all of the talks. So today we'll be hearing from uh, Dr. Roshan Joseph, winner of the uh, Nelson Award. And again, you can check out that particular link for more details on the series. All right, so now we'll get into the particular presentation. And first we'll talk a little bit about the Lloyd S. Nelson Award, which recognizes the article printed in Journal of Quality Technology in last year's uh, publications that is considered of greatest impact to practitioners. This year's award committee was chaired by Dr. Yili Hong with uh, members of Stephanie DeHart and David Edwards. And together they selected as the winners um, the paper on designing computer experiments with multiple types of factors, the Max Pro approach. And the authors being Dr. Roshan Joseph will be presenting this today and his co-authors, Evan Gould and Sean Ba. You can find that in volume 52, issue four. Um, I encourage you to check it out. And with that, congratulations to our award winners. And at this point, I will introduce Dr. Usha. So I will stop sharing my screen here real quick. And pull up Dr. Usha's intro. Okay. Just a second. All right, sorry about that. <laughs> Almost, very close, very close, we're getting there. <laughs> Make sure, okay, here we go. All right, so Dr. Roshan Joseph is the A. Russell Chandler III Chair and Professor in the Stewart School of Industrial and Systems Engineering at Georgia Tech. He holds a PhD degree in statistics from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. His research focuses on computational and applied statistics with applications to engineering. He is a recipient of the Career Award from NSF in 2005, the Jack Uden Prize from the ASQ in 2005, Best Paper Award from IEEE Transactions in 2009, an Edelman Laureate, from INFORMS in 2017, SPES Award from the ASA in 2019, a SPEG Award from the ASA in 2020, and now a Nelson Award winner in 2021. He is a fellow of the ASA and the ASQ and currently serves as the Editor-in-Chief of Technometrics. Dr. Joseph, welcome. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, uh, thank you, Caleb, for the kind introduction. And I also would like to thank the uh, committee for you know, selecting our paper for the award. It's a great honor. And uh, thank you all for joining for this presentation. Uh, so I will go ahead and uh, share my uh, screen. Uh, 
Uh, Caleb, can you see it? Yes, I can. Okay, perfect. Um, so uh, yeah, so uh, today's talk is about uh, Max Pro designs for computer experiments. Uh, so uh, the, the JQT pa paper that received the Nelson Award is on uh, using Max Pro designs for um, quantitative and uh, qualitative factors. But uh, um, some of you may not be familiar with space filling design. So I made this uh, talk a little bit more uh, general, um, but focused on Max Pro designs. And uh, this is a joint work with uh, Shanba and Evan Gurr. So I'll start with an uh, uh, introduction to space filling designs, uh, talk a little bit about ma Minimax, Maximin designs, Latin hypercube designs, and then introduce the main topic of Max Pro. And then uh, I'll show how it can be extended to qualitative factors. Uh, at the end, I will uh, uh, describe the R package available for implementing all the things that I am showing you here today. So uh, th this introduction is mainly taken from uh, a review paper that I wrote uh, a few years ago in quality engineering. So if you're interested, uh, you can take a look at that paper. So yeah, so we are here we are uh, trying to design experiments for um, computer experiments, which uh, is assumed to be uh, an expensive black box uh, computer code. Uh, producing deterministic outputs. And uh, the relationships can be quite complex, the output uh, input relationship. And uh, we want to um, design an experiment and uh, model that input output relation and uh, maybe approximate it using a statistical model. So that's the aim. And uh, here we are focused on how to do that experiment, how to design that experiment. So uh, here is a, a real example. Uh, it's a machining uh, simulation using production module software. So uh, you can see on the left side, you know, there is a console where you can plug in all the uh, cutter diameter, uh, number of flutes, and helix angle, relief angle, and so on. And uh, the the computer code simulates that machining process and gives you the output of here. I'm showing the tangential force acting on the tool uh, over time. So now it's a complex uh, output, and uh, you know we, we want to relate that output to all these inputs. So how should we uh, perform these simulations? Okay, let, let, let's just take a uh, two uh, variable example, say a helix angle and a relief angle. And if you do a random sample, you know of let's say seven points, you know it, it doesn't cover that space, right? There's a lot of gaps. So we don't know what's happening maybe on the upper uh, part of the of this region. So random samples, probably not a good idea to do experiments. I, I think that everyone agrees. Um, there will be big gaps in the experimental region and we may not be able to estimate that relationship quite well. But remember, we don't know that relationship, right? We have no idea about that relationship and where it is active in the region, et cetera, we don't know. That's why we would like to kind of spread out those points. That's where this space filling designs come in. There's a simple definition for space filling designs, designs that fill the space. Um, so, but what's the meaning of that filling the space? So there are several notions of space filling designs, such as the maximum type distance designs or minimax distance designs or uniform designs and so on. So uh, <clears throat> the minimax design was initially proposed by Johnson, Moore and Ilvi Sacker, 1991. So what it does is, okay, let's, uh, let's denote this uh, design by these uh, points x1, x2 through xn, everything scaled in a unit hypercube. Okay, let's say the, uh, our experimental region is a unit hypercube. If it is not a unit hypercube, I will explain later how we can deal with that. Okay, so let's for the moment take it as a unit hypercube. And what the minimax dis distance design does is it tries to find the maximum gap in the region and then try to find the design that will minimize that maximum gap. That, that, that makes sense because we want to you know, fill in the points such that no region is left out. 
So here is the minimax design on those seven points. So compared to those, you know, random samples that I showed you, you can see that the minimax design kind of, you know, fill in the space and the worst distance to the region is minimized. It's, it's, it's a computationally expensive procedure to uh, develop minimax designs. And uh, we have a paper on, uh, on, on that, on how to generate minimax designs, but it's, it's, it's very expensive. Maximum designs is another notion of space filling design, which is computationally much easier to uh, come, uh, develop. Okay, so here we are trying to maximize the minimum distance among the points. So we only need to compute the minimum distance and then try to find the design design that maximizes that minimum distance. And here is the maximum design in in seven points. It's also called sphere packing designs uh, for obvious reasons. Um, all right. So now there are um, some issues with this maximum and minimax designs. Uh, here I have shown the four point design and you can see that they, they have poor projections. The why projections are important because we may be uh, experimenting with the 10 factors but only maybe two or three may be really important. Okay, so we want the experimental design to fill in those subspaces. Um, so that we can estimate that relationship in a much better way. The minimax maximum design can have poor space, uh, you know, projections. You, you, even in this uh, odd number case of seven points, you can see that you know the there is you know lot lot of uh, redundancy if you project the points onto either of the axes. So that's where uh, this uh, Latin hypercube design comes in, where we can ensure good one dimensional projections so here it's a um, it's a, a seven point latin hypercube design and you can see that when you project onto either x1 or x2 you have seven different values for the design points but this is also a latin hypercube design it does project onto seven values in x1 as well as in x2 but it's not a good design because x1 and x2 are highly correlated and there is a big gap in the experimental region that is unexplored. So this is clearly not a Latin, good Latin hypercube. So any Latin hypercube design would not do the job. So we need to find the best out of that. And that's what uh, Max Morris and uh, uh, Toby Mitchell proposed in 1995. Uh, I, I, trying to find the maximum design within the class of Latin hypercube design. So now you um, try to uh, maximize the minimum distance among the points in within a Latin hypercube design. And they propose this criterion, a reciprocal criterion. You can minimize this. When you minimize this, you can see the distance comes in the denominator. So the distance gets maximized. But now the designs are restricted to uh, the a Latin hypercube class. So here is a um, maximum Latin hypercube design in 20 points uh, in two dimensions, and it looks good. You know, it projects on to 20 different values in each dimension, but it's also very nicely filling the space because it's a, it's also a kind of maximum type design. It's, it maximizes the minimum distance among the points. But how about we have more number of variables? Let's say we have 10 variables. Now I am showing one of the two dimensional, two dimensional projections of this maximum Latin hypercube design. There are uh, 20, um, there are 10 choose two projections. So this is one of them and it doesn't look good. Okay, it is a Latin hypercube design, but it doesn't look good, as good as the previous one. The reason is, if you look closely at this criterion, it ensures good one-dimensional projections because we, we are restricting it to a Latin hypercube design. It also ensures a good space filling in the full dimensional space because we are kind of using the maximum distance idea here. But what happens in the projections from two dimensions to P minus dimensions is unknown. And it can be poor because the criterion doesn't control those projections. Well, we can try to extend that criterion 
to include all, all possible projections. So um, uh, that was done in this paper by Dragujic, Sandner, and uh, Dean in 2012. So then uh, the same criteria, now you have to sum over all possible projections. So there are a, there is a, a two more sums coming in and uh, the criterion becomes a bit more expensive to compute. And uh, you know, design optimization itself is a very difficult task and with an expensive objective function, it becomes even more difficult. So that's where we propose this uh, maximum projection designs. Is there a better way to ensure projections? And that is based on this weighted Euclidean distance idea. So, you, you, uh, so that distance criterion, where instead of using the Euclidean distance, you introduce some weight parameters, theta L, which is between zero and one, sums to one, okay? So it's a weighted Euclidean distance. And uh, modify the Morris-Mitchell criterion to include those weights. So it's, it's the same criterion, but now instead of the Euclidean distance, we are using a weighted Euclidean distance. But what should be the weights? You know, if, if we know a priori that some dimensions are important or some subspaces are important, we can give large weight to those, those variables. But we are doing experimental design. We don't know anything about the input-output relationship. So it's, uh, it's unlikely that we have some a priori knowledge on which variables are important. So in, in such a case, we can use a, like a Bayesian approach with a, a non-informative prior. So here is a non-informative prior on the thetas. And then we can average this criterion over that prior distribution. So it's an integral over that uh, um, P minus one dimensional space. Uh, it's P minus one because it sums to one. Okay? So now we can integrate this weights uh, with respect to those that prior distribution and compute the compute the expectation of that criteria. Okay, now we can try to minimize this criterion and uh, find the optimal design, which may be robust to this theta. However, our aim was to simplify the criterion proposed in Dragulic, uh, Sandner, and Dean, which has a you know four sums there, but integration is even more difficult, okay? So this is even more computationally expensive criteria. That, that, that doesn't look good, but that's where sometimes math is useful. You know, in this particular special case where you plug in, let's say that power, you know, here you are taking a power to K. If you, if you take it as two times the number of dimensions, two P, then that has an explicit solution. Okay. So that integration can be done explicitly to get an analytical solution. And that's given by this. So that's our max pro criteria. Now we are trying to minimize this. Now this, you know, you can see only double sum. So it's it's only at, you know, as expensive as the uh, Morris-Mitchell criterion. Instead of the Euclidean distance, you use kind of a product of the differences squared. So the, the only difference is that in the denominator, instead of a sum, over those p dimensions, it becomes like a product over the p dimension. So the cost is the same as um, you know Morris Mitchell criterion, which is all right. So this is much more cheap to compute than the Dragulic, Sandner, Dean uh, approach. So this seems like a feasible uh, way to do it. And since we have integrated over a non-informative prior of theta. Probably this will work for you know for many many uh, cases. So here is the uh, uh, Max Pro design. So we, we call this the maximum projection design, or in short for Max Pro design, in seven points, and it seems to be good. And you, you can see that now it, it's all also looks like a, uh, a Latin hypercube design. You know, twenty points. It also looks like a Latin hypercube design. That is because th this criterion. If you closely look at this criterion. If any of the levels in, in the projection becomes the same, then the denominator will become zero because it's a, it's a product. So any two values becomes the same in any dimension. 
then it, this criterion goes to infinity. So that's not allowed. So, so it, 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 it will never have a case where the values match up. So they, they have to be different. Otherwise, the criterion will be infinity. So max pro design ensures n distinct levels. In other words, the Latin hypercube requirement is kind of automatically enforced in the criteria. So that's, that's a big advantage over the uh, Morris and Mitchell approach where you need to restrict the optimization, you know, the, the, uh, the design to be a Latin hypercube design. So it's like adding a lot of constraints into the objective function, uh, into the optimization problem, it makes it very hard. It's like a discrete optimization problem. That is avoided. You know, this becomes a, like a continuous optimization problem where all those constraints are incorporated into the objective function. So um, here is the minimum distance uh, among the points plotted uh, for a 10 dimensional uh, problem. Uh, we have generated a 100 run design. Okay, so we have generated a 100 run design in 10 dimensions using Max Pro, uh, restricting it to be an LHD. I will explain it a little bit more. And then the Max Pro design that's in red, the blue is the uh, maximum Latin hypercube design. Green is a uniform design. Now, I am showing the minimum distance over different projections. So uh, uh, if you look at the right side, the 10 dimension, and that's the full dimensional space, uh, the maximum Latin hypercube, that blue one, has the highest value. That is uh, expected because the, the aim, the, the objective function used in that is to maximize the minimum distance in the full dimensional space. So it does the best. So Max Pro, the red one, is not as good as that blue one in the full dimensional space. But now let's say, look at the nine dimensional projections. Now suddenly the Max Pro start doing better than a Mac, maximum Latin hypercube design. The maximum Latin hypercube design, you can see that that performs goes down very fast as the, uh, the, 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 the projection dimension is decreased. Whereas the max pro, the minimum distance kind of maintains at the highest level, highest possible level. So what, what, it, what it shows is that take any projection, okay? The max pro design has better space filling property. The maximum Latin hypercube design has excellent space filling in the full dimensional space and also in the one dimensional projections. Whereas the Max Pro is a compromise. You cannot get everything right, but it's a compromise over all possible projections. And that, that, that seems like a good idea because we know that only a few factors are going to be active and we don't know which subspace of the, those factors are going to be important. So using Max Pro, we can get a good design in that particular subspace. It doesn't matter which subspace becomes important at the end. So that's the uh, advantage of using a Max Pro design. Now here, here is the uh, a histogram of the uh, points on, on one dimensional space. So you can see that the Max Pro points are not uniformly spread out in the region. You might have noticed that in this also, um, the, the points in the center are slightly wider. And you know when I put the grids, towards the boundaries, it becomes a little bit narrow. So the points are a little bit pushed towards the boundaries so that you can see this kind of a U shape, a little bit less on the, in, uh, in the middle center region of the space, but more towards the boundary. So it's not uniformly spread out. So not exactly a Latin hypercube design. This could be called a generalized Latin hypercube design. Now, uh, so we don't have a uniform design property here, okay? Uniform designs try to spend the, uh, 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 put the points uniformly in the region. So Max Pro doesn't do that, okay? It, it pushes the points a little bit more to the, to the boundaries. Is that uh, good or bad? Okay, so if you look at uh, a uniform design, so he, here is the distribution of a uniform design in shown in that blue, which is very good uh, design if our, um, surface is expected to be very rough. Okay, input-output relationship is 
highly complex and very rough, then a uniform design might work well. But if the surface is expected to be very smooth, in this paper by Dette and Papalicia, they showed that a, a, a distribution uh, with an asymptotically an arc sign distribution will be the best. It is a kind of a, a, a limiting case of a de-optimal design for a very high degree point only, also known as Chebyshev points. Okay. So if you use such, such a point set, which is shown in that black with that distribution, that will be a better design if your input-output relation is very smooth. Because uh, you might have seen, uh, you know, uh, while fitting Gaussian process models or some uh, polynomial models, most of the uncertainty happens at the edges, not in the center. Center, we have a lot of confidence. Interpolation is always good with statistical models, but extrapolation towards the boundaries is the problem. So placing more points in the boundaries seems like a good idea, especially when we are dealing with very smooth response surfaces. So in that sense, you know, MaxPro is doing a good job. In fact, MaxPro happened to be somewhere between a uniform design and this arc sign distribution, somewhere exactly in the middle. So uh, MaxPro tends to work well with the smooth surfaces, um, but if, if, if you expect the surface to be very rough, then you could, again, restrict the max pro design to be a Latin hypercube design to make it uniform. That's what we call the max pro LHD. All right, now um, Gaussian process modeling is the most commonly used modeling technique uh, for computer experiments because we want interpolation as well as uncertainty quantification. So, um, uh, uh, he, he, uh, suppose we use a, a Gaussian correlation function. Okay, so that's what is shown here in three dimensions. Uh, alpha L is the the scale uh, uh, parameters in that Gaussian correlation function. So the, the question is, which one, which design would be the best uh, for fitting a Gaussian process model? Okay, so this is like a model based design. So far, we have been looking at just the space filling properties. But now we are asking for a model-based design. If you want to fit a Gaussian process model, what's the best design? Well, we don't know those uh, scale parameters before uh, getting the data. So if you assume a, a non-informative prior, interestingly, the max pro design minimizes the off-diagonal elements of the correlation matrix. The proof is very simple. If you look at that expectation, Expectation goes inside that summation. The the because it's a Gaussian correlation, you know that pro, uh, product of that uh, the integral uh, can be inside the integral of that product becomes the product of the one-dimensional integrals and becomes the max pro criterion. You can see it's one over that product of the differences. So that is a very interesting result um, uh, showing that. Max pro designs are actually very good if you are planning to fit a Gaussian process model with the Gaussian correlation function. Here is another justification. If you if you look at uh, this distance criterion uh, that was used in the you know maximum and minimax uh, definitions, this this power parameter small s uh, should be greater than one. But what if we, we take it to zero? Okay, we make it small. It, it's not a um, distance metric anymore when it is less than one. But if you take that limit of S going to zero, that reduces to again a product, the max pro criterion. So somehow the max pro criterion seems to have optimality when we think about all this in many different directions, it ends up in max pro. So it seems like a good criterion to use for space building design. Now, uh, this, this particular uh, uh, JQT, J, JQT paper deals with the uh, uh, qualitative factors because the MaxPro criterion assumes all the factors to be continuous, but you know, in reality, some of the factors can be qualitative. For example, there could be even discrete numeric factor. It's a, uh, it's a quantitative factor, but it could be discrete numeric, like the number of flutes shown here. It could be one, two, three, four, five, and so on. 
and there are uh, in this example there are like many continuous factors but um I, I think in the previous console you can choose the tool material you can have different types of tool material you can choose uh, to do this machining simulation which is a nominal qualitative factor we can also have ordinal uh, uh, qualitative factor um, maybe condition of the tool could be excellent very good good but that, that that facility is not there in this particular software but i'm just making it up but we could so uh, the, the, my point is that when we design a computer experiments we can have different types of factors it could be discrete numeric factor continuous factor or nominal factor or ordinal factor how do we uh, design an experiments with a combination of all these different types of factors so <clears throat> um, uh, peterson proposed this uh, sliced latin hypercube design in 2012 it is an example of a sliced Latin hypercube design with the two continuous factors and one nominal factor at three levels. The beauty of this design is that um, it's uh, in the that continuous space. It is a Latin hypercube design, nine point Latin hypercube design. But within each slice, within each level of that nominal factor, also it, it is a Latin hypercube design. So just to show you, this is not a Latin hypercube design. You can see that within these three levels it doesn't form a latin hypercube so um, that, that's a very uh, nice beautiful structure for doing experiments with the both continuous and nominal factors huh. the, the only only trouble is that although the structure is beautiful it's very restrictive yeah. the number of ranks can become very huge if you want to do a sliced latin hypercube design so uh, can we extend the um, Max Pro design to deal with these, these different types of factors? So uh, re remember that the Ma Max Pro de uh, design has this optimality property. It minimizes the sum of off-diagonal elements of the correlation matrix, where the uh, expectation is taken with respect to a no non-informative prior for the correlation parameters. So if you choose different types of correlation functions, and there exists, you know, even for nominal factors, we can just use this definition to come up with the extent, extension of the max pro criterion for different types of factors. So that's that's the idea we are using in this paper. So we just define a correlation function for continuous and uh, uh, discrete numeric and uh, um, call it, uh, the nominal factor. So if it, if there is an ordinal factor, we use um, a kind of a scoring to convert it into a um, numeric factor, okay, discrete numeric factor. So finally, we only need to consider these three types of factors, a continuous factor, so that's the left one. Uh, the middle one is for a discrete numeric factor and another correlation function for a nominal factor. Here we can't use the non-informative prior anymore because for discrete numeric and nominal factors, uh, the levels can get repeated. So if you use non-informative prior, you know everything goes to infinity. That's not allowed. So we we can uh, use informative priors here. So if if you put some kind of you know here, here we have chosen the gamma prior because again we can explicitly evaluate all these integrals and get an you know analytical solution that's very important when we do design optimization the objective function has to be as simple as possible so this is the um, criterion the, the extension of the max pro criterion to deal with the discrete numeric as well as uh, nominal type factors it just have different different terms in it that's all so and we have some uh, sensible choices for those prior values it's just the one divided by the number of levels uh, for continuous factor, the number of levels can be infinity, so it makes sense to take it as zero and get full projections. But for the other one, there is a factor added to it, so it will not go to zero in the denominator. So going back to that uh, solid and milling, milling simulation um, experiment with the three continuous factors and one discrete numeric factor and uh, two nominal factors. So um, Suppose we want 48 run design. 
If you were to use a, sli a slice like in hypercube designs uh, with five points in each slice, that, that itself would require 360 runs because it has a structure to maintain and that is not very flexible. So the number of runs needed will be very high. So here is the Max Pro designs with those uh, 48 runs and you can see at different uh, projections, you know, it does a good job. Okay, it's uh, you know, don't worry about all this. It looks good. All right. Now uh, I will I would like to explain how to use um, this R package Max Pro to implement all these methods. If you're a Jump user, Jump also has a Max Pro option in it under the uh, Triple F uh, space filling design uh, in in Jump. Okay, so, um, but I, I'm going to explain this, this package Max Pro in R, uh, which can be downloaded from CRAM. So, suppose we want to uh, generate a Max Pro Latin hypercube design. Okay, now we are restricting it to be an exactly Latin hypercube design so that it will have equally spaced levels. Um, so this is the function to use max pro LHD, specify the number of um, points that you need, let's say 40 points, let's say two dimensions, P is equal to two, and it will give you, you know, the design and the max pro measure and things like that. So here I'm asking for the design so that, so it's just one, one line of code, you can get the output, the max pro LHD. Um, within that code, it uses an exchange algorithm. Start with, starts with a random design and then exchanges the levels to improve the Max Pro um, criteria. <clears throat> now, if you want a Max Pro design, you can use this Max Pro function in the package, but you need to provide an initial design. So, what we usually do is first do this uh, exchange algorithm and create a max pro LHD first, and then use the max pro function with that as, as the starting design, that in, as the initial design. So it does a local optimization. You can see the previous blue circles are now, uh, uh, we do an optimization with that as the starting point. So the final optimal design that we get is the red crosses, which is the max pro design. And as expected, you know, it pushes the points out a little bit more. So you will have a fewer points in the center, more towards the boundary, it pushes towards the boundary and it's a local optimization. So uh, it depends on the uh, initial design. So if, if you need to start with a good initial design to get that. So that's why we start with a Max Pro LHD and then do this optimization. But again, just one step process. Similarly, um, we can do um, Max Pro QQ for generating um, Max Pro designs with the continuous factors, discrete numeric factors, and nominal factors. Suppose we have uh, an example here with the two continuous factors, uh, x1 and x2, and one nominal factor with the four levels. So, and suppose we want 40 run design. So as before, I start with a Max Pro LHD um, for the continuous factor. And then you need to also choose a design for the nominal factor. So this could be anything. It could be random or it could be a orthogonal array, whatever you like, you choose there as a D2 and choose that as the initial design. Specify the number of nominal factors in that function Max Pro QQ, and that will give you the Max Pro design with the two continuous factors and one nominal factor. So th this max pro QQ function does uh, just do the exchanges, okay? So uh, based on the initial design you provided, it will exchange the levels to improve the max pro criteria. So the only input needed in this function is, um, is an initial design. All right. Um, the max pro augment is another very useful uh, function in the in the um, in the package. I see a, a chat. Uh, uh, yeah, Christine Anderson Cook has a question for all the uh, continuous factors. What are 
typical differences in performance between the Max Pro LHS and the Max Pro designs? Are the gains more as the dimension of the input space increases? So uh, that, that's a very good question. So uh, what, what uh, Christine is uh, asking, you know, what's the advantage of you know doing a Max Pro design over a Max Pro LHD? Um, as I mentioned before, if if you expect the function to be very smooth, then uh, using a Max Pro uh, design would be better. Uh, but if you don't know anything about it, it could, and if you think that it could be a very rough surface, then maybe Max Pro LHD itself is good. So. Yeah, it's a difficult question to answer because it depends on what kind of uh, response surface you're dealing with. Most of the cases in a mo most engineering systems, you know, the, the surfaces are smooth. So I am, uh, my guess is that Max Pro would be better. Yeah, LHD is also fine. So uh, uh, Christina, I, I hope uh, I have answered your question. Uh, if not, you know, uh, at the end of uh, my talk, we can talk about this again. So again, uh, this uh, Max Pro augment is a is a very useful function in the Max Pro package, which does a one at a time uh, greedy optimization. Okay, so you start with a point and then add another point uh, based on the Max Pro criteria. So that, that's a very simple optimization to do instead of the full dimensional optimization, here you do one point at a time. It's a greedy procedure, so you may not get the optimal max pro design, okay? But um, you, you might get an approximately optimal design and maybe good for the purpose, but it has many, many uses. So I'm going to show you a few examples. So to do this, uh, you, you need to start with a candidate set. Okay, so you need to, so th this is done, you know, you have to provide a candidate set, start from some point, and then from the candidate set, it chooses the best point according to the max pro criteria. So, so here is a, a illustration for a, if you want to generate a sequential design, you want, you know, um, before the experiment, you, you know, people usually use 10 times the number of uh, dimensions as the number of runs, right? That's the, um, uh, the thumb rule in in computer experiments you use 10d or 10p so but th that's just a thumb rule we don't know maybe in some problems maybe 2p is good enough or maybe in some other problem even 100p is needed so one option is to just do it one at a time um so here is a way to generate that one at a time design or even batch designs in a non-adaptive manner, okay? So we are not using the responses here, just trying to generate the points one at a time to fill the space using max pro criteria. The, the response information is not used here. So that's why I call it non-adaptive sequential design. So uh, let's say we, uh, we are thinking, you know, up to 40 points, that's the maximum budget allowed. So we, we need to first generate some candidate points. So there is another uh, function in uh, in Max Pro package, can points, which can be used to generate candidate points. So it will automatically generate those points for you. So here again, the same case of two continuous and one nominal factor. Can okay, I see a, a question between L2? Uh, so this is a question from Demola Akinella. Uh, between L2 discrepancy criterion and Max Pro criterion, which one should be preferred for good space theory? Uh, okay, that, that's again a very good question. So before proceeding, let me answer that question. So I would uh, probably go back to um, this picture that I showed you before, this one, okay? So that blue is based on the L2 criteria, the blue, the maximum Latin hypercube design. The red one is based on the max pro criteria. So, so this is the case where we have 10 factors, okay? So if you think all the 10 factors are equally important, all of them, okay? Then the L2 criteria, the max, max, maximum Latin hypercube design would do the best job. But if only nine factors are going to be important or only eight factors are going to be active and so on, 
then the Max Pro might be better because it will have better space filling in the lower dimensional projections. So I hope I answered your question. Uh, if not, again, we can discuss at the end. Um, so going back to the, um, the um, Max Pro augment function, here it is. So yeah, so you can generate this uh, candidate set of points. Um, so I have generated 4,000 of them. The larger the better, but it takes more time than to augment. So now you use this max pro augment function. Okay, start from some value, maybe randomly at some point in that uh, from the candidate set, and then use the max pro augment. You give the starting point and then give the candidate set and ask how many more you need. So, and new is like 40, 39 more points. And then you need to specify, if there are nominal factors, you need to specify how many nominal factors and how many levels you have. So it's just one line again, you get, you know, starting from that one, you can see it started somewhere here and then two goes here, three is uh, blue on the low, lower, I, I hope you can see my cursor. So three is here, four is here and so on. So it keeps adding um, using the max pro criterion. And the nice thing is that, you know, whether it's continuous, nominal, it doesn't matter. And it keeps adding according to max pro criteria, each one point at a time, greedy optimization, okay? So uh, the 40 points uh, looks good. You know, it, it fills that space in the continuous space. And uh, uh, if you look at the blue, uh, green, uh, red, and black points, that they are also, you know, uh, spread out very well in all the regions. Um, if you count the number of po you know, points at the end uh, for each of the level, you have uh, on the uh, lower left-hand corner, I have shown it, you know, 10 values at the first level, 10 at second, nine at the third level, and 11 uh, experiments at the fourth level. So it's not perfectly balanced, okay? It's not perfectly balanced. That is expected because we are doing a greedy optimization, but it's pretty good, you know? It's almost you know, perfect. Um, but it's, it's, it's very nice because you are doing, you know, you have a lot of flexibility. We can stop any point, you know, or keep going. So the same idea can be used uh, if you have constraint regions. The only thing is that you need a candidate sets. Uh, so here I am saying, okay, the only that white region is my, you know, feasible region. There should not be any point in that red region and I cut off some portion in the on the uh, top right corner. Um, how do we generate design, a Max Pro design? Again, um, space filling design can be very hard with the constraints uh, on the regions, but with this Max Pro augment function, it's very easy. As long as you give uh, a candidate set, it will start choosing the points from the candidate set sequentially, one at a time and uh, you get a max pro design in the constrained region. The only difficulty here is how to generate the candidate set in the constrained space. For two dimensional case with this, this problem, it's very easy, you know, you generate a big um, Latin hypercube design or something and then uh, reject all the points in the, uh, in the uh, infeasible region. But in high dimensional space, if they have lots of constraints, then the feasible region can be extremely small. So uh, how to generate points in that, that uh, you know, tiny space in a big, big region is a difficult problem. And we have a very recent paper on that. Uh, I have given the reference here, the, uh, this, uh, this paper, Constrained Minimum Energy Designs is available in, uh, from the website of Statistics and Computing. So if you are you know, dealing with a constraint uh, uh, problem, you know, uh, take a look. Another, another uh, use of that max pro uh, augment function is suppose you already performed some experiments, which is shown on the left hand side, the black crosses, but now you decided, okay, I want to do 10 more experiments. Where should I do 10 more experiments? Or I want to validate my model fitter. You know, 
on those uh, on those previous points i want to check if my model is doing good or not many times people just do another random sample but if you use a max pro augment function you will get points that are away from the previous points and will try to fill in the points so if you can validate your computer model at those blue points you know then that's a very good model because you know that's that's away from all the crosses and also fill in the space so that's another another uh, application of a simple application of max pro design okay another an, uh, max pro augment function uh, here is another uh, use of max pro augment function for developing nested designs which is very useful if you have multi fidelity simulations so here is an example with the uh, three three fidelity levels low medium high how do you uh, generate nested design so here is again a simple idea um, you start with a let's say low fidelity ex, uh, simulation okay so 100 points here at the low level so that's that can be generated using let's say max pro lhd then we can use max pro augment function to choose uh, i think here i chose 30 points out of it so start from some point and then choose another 29 points so that's a nested design you know, so the medium fidelity ex uh, experiments can be done at the same values as the um, as the low fidelity level it, it, it's nested within that now we have another high fidelity simulator then again you can start from one of those red triangles and uh, you know here I, I think 10 points nine points you can add using again max pro augment function so those are the green circles so again it's a, it's nested within the medium level so you have you can uh, produce nested designs any number of um, fidelity levels very easily uh, using this max pro augment function yeah this can be done in different ways you know here i went from low to high maybe it's better you start from high and go to the low that may be better because high we want the best possible design so let me see the time 152 i, I that's all i have uh, uh, so i will stop here um caleb um so that's the end of my talk thank you all for listening yeah thank you dr joseph that was really great uh talk um i currently don't see any other oh there we go we got a question from Christine Anderson Cook. She asked, what would be a typical time to generate a good Max Pro design for five to 10 inputs using the R package? So um, Christine, that's a very good question. Um, um, I think uh, in a few minutes, it can be generated. Uh, five to 10 inputs, you know, it, it'll take only a few minutes. Uh, but if you are, uh, you know, maybe let's say a few hundred runs, but if you want like two, uh, 300, 500,000 run, then it becomes difficult, okay? It, it's, uh, it, it's very time consuming. Um, so I have a student working on that and hopefully we will have uh, some improved versions very soon. And it's, it's already promising, you know, uh, very, very big Max Pro designs can be generated in a few seconds, but the current, uh, current capability of this package, it takes a few minutes for some, you know, 100 runs in 10 factors. Okay. All right. Let's see if we, do we have any other questions. So you can either ask your question in the Q&A. You can also raise your hand and we'll try and let you uh, turn on your screen and audio if you want to do that. So I guess while we'll wait, I kind of had a uh, question hopefully okay. it's not too simple uh so i know in this in this new approach when you include the uh, the nominal and discrete numeric factors the prior you use now becomes a little more informative i guess have you assessed sensitivity to that um how how sensitive is it to these uh these more informative priors that you're starting to use yeah that's a very good uh, question caleb um so yeah, so th these these uh, are also very flat type uh, 
uh, right? So, it, uh, you know, if you plot it and see, you know, this gamma is also kind of not very informative, okay? So, okay. but of course, yeah, some, uh, it's not completely non-informative because we cannot use that with, you know, you know, when the levels are getting repeated. So, um, we haven't studied its sensitivity very carefully, okay? We haven't studied that very carefully, but yeah, the result seems to be fine. Um, yeah. So we have tested numerically at the at these uh, specific choices, and it seems to produce good results. So yeah, this was part of Evans' PhD thesis. So he tried different uh, possible values of that beta, gamma, and alpha, and this is found to be the best from his uh, numerical experiments. Thank you. Have any other questions? All right. Well, in that case, uh, thank you again, Dr. Joseph, for presenting and congratulations again on winning the Nelson Award. And uh, we'll look to be posting uh, this presentation and the corresponding slides up on the FTC website uh, pretty soon after this. So. Be sure to check it out there and uh, thanks again for attending. Don't miss Friday's talk as well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.